scripture memory verse tonight, 2 Timothy 2, 4, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he might please him who enlisted him as a soldier. 2 Timothy 2, 4. Anybody else? Don't fall over top of each other if you're in war. King James is that no one that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he might please him who called him to be a soldier. King James. I, I think it does. I could be wrong right now, but nobody else has it? Second Timothy two four. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. 2 Timothy 2.4 Good job, Sonia. Anybody else? 2 <clears throat> Timothy 2.4 No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. 2 Timothy 2.4 Good job. Now, Sonia said may, which is what it says in the New King James. Me and you both said might, and that's fine. If you look up the word may in the Greek, it probably means them both the same. May, might. Anybody else want to try it? Good job. Anybody else? Read it, try it. Second Timothy 2 4. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Second Timothy 2 4. Good job. Anybody else want to try to do it or read it? Totally up to you. Now this is, of course, a letter. It, it, the name is, to, is Timothy. Um, and it's written to Timothy, obviously. But it's written by Paul from prison. It's his last letter. So we always want to remember that. Written around A.D. 66, 67. I think after this book was written, he was released by Nero for a couple years. Rearrested when they blamed Rome burning on the Christians and then he was killed um, it's his last words I think I'm going to go a little bit deeper into it today there's a lot going on and I thought we might start in 1-1 one, one and read all of chapter 1 and see that he's really leading up to a point of what's going on He's really leading up to our salvation and being called and then the things that we're supposed to be doing. Now, I can tell you that when you look at this as, as I've been looking at it, everything is a marriage. We're married to Christ. When you have these words that are in the King James, not in the, or excuse me, the New King James, not in the King James, but in the New King James, it actually talks about being engaged. See, that's a word we use today. Now, it's talking about soldiers, but it's engaged. So what do you do? You get engaged. Right now we're betrothed to Christ. And while you're betrothed to Christ or engaged, you're not supposed to have any affairs. You're only supposed to be focused on preparing yourself for the groom as the bride. And this here, it, it, even though we're talking about a soldier, we have some words that look like a marriage. And I just noticed that because of those words and the way that our uh, uh, context is today, the way we say engaged and we say having an affair you know so when you're caught up in something else you're really focused on it you're dealing with it you're chasing it you're having an affair against what you're supposed to be doing by following your husbandman and now you know sunday we're going to be in that the vine dresser is the husbandman with i am the, the you know with, with john 15 so we want to remember that because there's a lot of different words that god will use in these analogies to refer to us and to refer to himself but you got to keep your analogies and understand that they are the same thing. In a minute, he's going to talk about he's going to be talking about athletics. 
He's going to be talking about a farmer. But he's using them as analogies where you've got to place yourself in it and say, what would I be doing in that practical sense if I was doing that? If I'm farming, I want to be the one to partake of the fruit, right? If I'm doing athletics, I have to play by the rules or there's no sense. He's going to talk about that in 2, 5, 2, 6. And so these are things you have to remember. He's using analogies. He's using metaphors. And, and although we are soldiers in the army of the living God, we're the bride of Christ being prepared. And we have to remember that the war is already over with. He's won the war. We're standing. We're clothing ourselves. We're standing in the armor and just guarding the inheritance so that the enemy doesn't steal it from us. How does he steal it? He uses lies. He lies to us. He gets us focused other places, chasing other things, involved in other relationships that are affairs. So you got to remember that. This is, it's always a marriage. We're the bride of Christ. We're betrothed to Christ. And he's adorning us. He's washing us. He's cleansing us by the power of the Holy Spirit. As we open up the truth and we learn what's going on in truth, we're becoming more like him. And we're learning that there's nowhere to go but to stay really close to his side where we were birthed from. Okay? And that, that always is washing and cleansing and purifying. And we're becoming like him, which is the finality of all of this. When we're totally consummate the marriage at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And the two become one completely. I love that. I love that. So let's actually seriously go to one one. And just start looking at this a little bit. Because really, when you think about it, when you think about a man's last words. Now, I, I don't know for sure that he knew. Boy, when I put the pen to this letter, and he probably had a scribe writing it because uh, uh, he just did that. It was a practice. But I don't know that he knew, man, I'm going to die here in a minute. Because he does get released. He's, he's actually already given his case, they say, in his, his uh, historicity. He's already uh, uh, shared the gospel with Nero. And many people believe that Nero went crazy after he rejected the gospel. And that's when he burnt down Rome playing a violin. And then he blamed it on the Christians in order. And, and it's much like, I mean, and you guys might go, he's a nutcase. No, it's much like what we see today with the riots. And we're burning down cities and we're rebuilding them. And then they're blaming it all on truth. They're going to blame it on the Christians ultimately. But really they were burning those places down so they could rebuild other stuff and make more money with it. And that's all Nero was doing. He burned it down so he could rebuild it in his own name and everything would be attributed to him as a legacy. And see, that's what the devil wants to do. That's what your, your pomp and your power and your prestige of these politicians want to do. And those that run the one world government in the world, they want it to be all about their legacy and what they're doing. But the devil's using them as useful idiots. And I won't go into too much more of that because we're trying to study the word of God. But don't miss the parallels that are always there because the same thing is going on in every age, and it's whether God allows it or not. God's the one that's still in control, and he's still dealing with the hearts of his own people, and we're supposed to be allowing him to wash us and cleanse us and sanctify us. So 2 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, he's the author, an apostle, an apostle means one sent forth, uh, and many people challenge his apostleship, but he clearly was an apostle sent by God, Acts chapter 9, uh, of Jesus Christ. Notice, mine has a letter. Does yours have a letter? There's some, there, we're going to see it again in, in, here in a little bit. It really should be since Christ has died and then yea rose again, no longer is the focus on Jesus. It always is on Christ. And after Jesus rose from the grave, we should always use his name as Christ Jesus because now he's no longer flesh. He's the anointed. He's the Messiah. He's Christ. So it's Christ Jesus. He was Jesus in the flesh, the Lord's salvation. But now that he's brought salvation, it should really be translated all the time after the cross, Christ Jesus. Putting the focus on his anointing and on his deity, not on his flesh. Because just like he was, he became flesh. And now he's back as, as seated in the heavenly places. You and I first have to be flesh and then we can be spirit now we've been flesh our eyes are opened by the spirit of god we're sealed we're being led and now we become the spiritual men that he wants us to be and we follow him into heaven that's again first corinthians 15 
So uh, it, it, that's why there's a note there. And mine does say Christ Jesus instead of Jesus Christ. In a minute, though, you're going to see he refers to a different time. And he literally says Jesus Christ. And there's no note because it doesn't need to be there because he's referring to the flesh first. And anyway, I'll show it to you when we get to it. Um, that don't mean to complicate it. But there is a reason sometimes why the Holy Spirit does everything that he does. And we need to understand these as we're reading the Bible. Why is he saying this? I was just earlier uh, at a farm store, and I got into it with some people. And I say got into it because they became really aggressive and gnashing their teeth and mocking, and, and they did not like at all and would not entertain anything about Jesus. And I just had to go, here, you know what? Hell's a hot place, and walk away. And, 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 but they did not want that. And, and why, is, why is the world so mad at God? Why do they hate God? Why is it they will entertain any thought whatsoever and talk with you until you mention Jesus and then they become aggressively like gnashing their teeth and mocking and they want to argue to vehemently about vehemently about other things like evolution and, and they'll believe that there's monkeys turning into men but they won't believe that a loving God and I'm just look I, I, I shared that with them I'm like I don't understand this because you guys are pretty aggressive about this. And it's really, it's really just, uh, it's the signs of the time where they'll stand and try to sell you something. And, and they were trying to sell me windows. And I was like, that's a really small window. You live in a tiny house? And uh, <laughs> anyway, it was a sample. So it's always fun. It's always fun to mess with people. You start a conversation. And, and uh, I mean, and here's a, here's, a, here's a kid named Levi. You know, and, and, and his middle name comes out of Japheth's family, Javen. I mean, I, I get there, I got everything about him, I talked to him, and they were happy as long as I was talking about them and what they were doing. But when I moved to eternal things, it, it was almost like they started, it was really weird. I was like, oh, wow, that's pretty crazy. And it was almost like they were gnashing their teeth at me. They were so angry about the spiritual things. And rather believe the other planets got stuff on them and all kinds of weird stuff. And I'm like, oh, really? Where do you, where, how did you come to that knowledge of that? Where did you find that at? Oh, I, yeah, and so I've got a book that's got 66 books and by 40 authors that tell me everything that God has done. And you're just telling me something that you think might be true and you have no basis whatsoever for it. Yet you will argue against the book that I'm telling you about, a God who loves us. It's really, really difficult times to share, but we have to share in the marketplace, no matter how they act. And that's what Paul done, and that's what we should know. But so why is Paul called and sent forth as an apostle? Uh, he tells us right here, of who? Jesus Christ. That's who he represents. We're ambassadors of Christ, and it's by the will of God. And a will is always a written document. It's a last will and testament. It's a written document. Somebody had to die in order for the will to become active. If it wasn't for the will of God, he would still be under the law of God. But he clearly explains why he's not under law anymore. And Christ has died and yea, rose again. And now the will of God can be enacted by the Holy Spirit, the executor of the estate. And why is it? Oh, it's like some new thing. No, it's according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Notice it says it right this time. And it's been a promise that God had made that he was going to do. Old Testament saints look forward. He's explaining this to them. This is the promises. It's fulfilled. And this is how he opens the letter. And it's last words. Think about that. The Holy Spirit knew that. Paul didn't know that. He didn't know that he was going to die here quite soon. But the Holy Spirit always knew it and uses him in the last words. What am I going to say? And he says, he tells us to, you know, we write letters differently nowadays. We sign it at the bottom of it. But he says his name first instead of a salutation. And then he says who it's to, his beloved son. And, of course, it's not his real biological son, but it's a son in the faith. And you have to remember the family of God is a stronger bond than our real families we were born in because of the spirit of God. We were born by water. We're born into families in the flesh, but we're going to live for eternity in the family of God. So he calls him a beloved son. Grace, mercy, peace. And you can only get grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice again, Christ Jesus, not Jesus Christ. These are important things to look at when you're looking at scriptures. 
Where's the Holy Spirit at though? Where's the Trinity? The Holy Spirit's writing this. So they're all together, but he never wants attention. See, the Holy Spirit does not want attention. That's why I have a problem with somebody who says, we're having a Holy Spirit revival. Well, how are you doing that? Because he doesn't want attention. He would not tell you to have a Holy Spirit revival. He might tell you to, to preach and encourage people to, to go out and, and live, but he doesn't want you to draw attention. Everything that he does is to magnify Christ. And everything that Christ is doing is to glorify the Father. So they're all three here in, Trin in the Trinity. They're all three there. They, he just doesn't mention himself, which is amazing to me. I thank God, and we should be thankful, whom I serve with a pure conscience. He's, he's saying he's got a pure conscience. Listen, he's saying I'm blameless, not sinless. Listen, we can be blameless because of the righteousness of Christ. And you keep running the race by the rules because you're following the, the, what your identity is. What you're supposed to do when you blow it, you confess it. God washes and cleanses you. So he's got a pure conscience. As my, And I'm not going to comment a bunch about this. As my forefathers did. So it's still the same thing. Notice that. He's not saying this is some new road. No, he's saying God's still fulfilling his promise. It's finished in Christ Jesus, the promise of life. And it's just like my forefathers did. They looked forward to the promise of life. But I can now tell you the mystery more clear because we've lived it. We're watching it. I met him. I talked to him every day. Oh, I'm getting excited. Calm him down. I mean, as without ceasing, so he does it all the time. I remember you in my prayers night and day. We should pray without ceasing also. Greatly desiring. Notice his heart. Notice what his heart. He's telling you his heart on the paper to see you. Timothy's his son in the faith. You know what I mean? He's been training him. He's been discipling him. He knows his family. Being mindful of your tears, probably when they hugged last and separated and they cried on each other because they know that, you know, it's not like it is today where we just. Oh, just FaceTime me and we'll talk together and we'll see each other. They were, they were without any of our, uh, of our uh, 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 gadgets, without any of our cars. These people were walking and they were going everywhere with the gospel. They weren't complaining. They weren't saying gas costs so much. They were getting the gospel out walking on shipwrecks three times in the sea, beaten. And he's still getting up and going out and getting the gospel out. Let's, I'm sorry, I'll get excited here. Um, and, he, and listen, look, look at what he says. When he's mindful of Timothy's tears, what does it do? That he's filled with joy. Because he remembers the love they have for one another, the family. It, it, he's thinking of tears. I'm like, what? How are you thinking of Timothy's tears when you separated last and it gives you great joy? Because he sees his son in the faith going and sharing the gospel. He sees that God is using other people because of the testimony that he shared and, and that he's being fruitful in the ministry because it's the will of God. If you just do the natural, God will do all the supernatural. So, five, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, A little bit of encouragement, a little bit of stirring up and, and stirring him on. Um, which dwelt first, he talks about his grandmother, Lois, his mother, Eunice. And I am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, I, I, I'm mindful that many people don't even like people to touch them today. But notice they laid on hands and they pray for people and send them out. When I came down here to this area, they laid hands on me. And the only thing that I can really give you by laying my hands on you is germs. <laughs> but when I pray and ask the Holy Spirit to do it, the Holy Spirit can give you gifts and talents and abilities. Right? It doesn't come from me. So don't, don't think that he's trying to say because of his hands. But what he was doing was commissioning. Because the Holy Spirit is sent him out to tell others the gospel and to tell them to go. So he's uh, doing that. That's verse 6. That's what we do with man. 
For God has not given us a spirit of fear, timidity, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is what we have to go out to be completed. Seven. Eight. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in sufferings. Man, you're a great disciple, Paul. You want me to go suffer? I thought you wanted me to go have a great ministry and wear $10,000 suits and, and have a church of thousands. No, share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, for the good news, according to the power of God. Listen to what he's saying is the gospel, what we're supposed to be sharing in. That's amazing to me that he's encouraging and telling him to stir him up, and he's writing his last letter, and he's saying that we will enter the kingdom of God through much suffering. When you're sharing the gospel, it's not going to be something that people readily accept. Now, when we're in a room like this and people are believers, it's great to talk about. We can expound on it. We can have great, a good time of fellowship. But when we go into the world that hates God, into the marketplace, they have a whole lot of stuff that they're wanting to do and say and be, and they don't want to hear it. Even if you're a carnal Christian, they don't want to hear it. Even if you're not living right, they don't want to hear it. And they'll say the same thing they said to Lot. Ever since you've been soldiering here, you've been trying to tell us what to do. And we're not there with you. We're not pursuing that. And in fact, they hate God. They hate God because they have to stop, listen, hear his word, and believe him. And they don't want to stop doing what they're doing. They want to keep doing what they're doing because sin is fun for a season. The verse 9, who has saved us. What? I saved us. Uh, the servant for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us delivered us from the sin nature and called us on the phone pick it up with a holy calling not according to our works ergon not according to what we've done but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us freely as a gift in Christ Jesus before time began. See, now he's just repeating what he said in Ephesians 2, 9, and 10. That's all, that's all he's doing, 2, 8, 9, and 10. For you're saved by grace through faith, it is not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus that we should walk in them. Created in Christ Jesus, yeah. Before time, he says. Before time, what? See, God's outside of time. We're inside of time before time even was existed. He created time just for this planet. That's amazing to me. Before time began? Over in uh, Titus 3, 5, and 6, he says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Through the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Listen, our relationship is with the Holy Spirit, but we point to Jesus because it's the blood that paid for our sin. It's the Holy Spirit that's teaching us, guiding us, leading us. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. He has given us the truth. He's the one that gives us the unction, the anointing, the gifts. He's the one that's washing and cleansing us. God is a Spirit. And He wants us just to open our mouth in the marketplace and share the gospel. But we have to learn the gospel. And that takes setting it at the master's feet. So before time began, but verse 10, but now has been revealed, manifested, it's appearing, of our, or excuse me, by the appearing. How was it revealed? By the appearing, the first advent of our Savior, Jesus Christ. See how it's twisted around? There's Jesus Christ because he came in the flesh and he was the anointed Christ. But he came in the flesh. He appeared in the flesh and then he died and now he's Christ Jesus. Who? What did he do when he was here? He abolished death. He put an end to death and brought life and immortality to light. How? Through the gospel. The good news that you can receive. He's given it to you. That he died and rose again. He paid for it all. You're to be justified just as if he never sinned. 
by believing that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. Verse 11, to which I was appointed. He was called a preacher, one who heralds divine truth, an apostle, one sent forth to go wherever God sends you, and a teacher, a didikos, I think is the word. You're expounding, and you have to have people that will listen. A teacher, and he says his specific calling, as Acts 9 tells us, to the Gentiles. Verse 12, for this reason I also suffer these things. He's in prison. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. He's not shutting up because they put him in prison. Why? For I know, listen to me, that's Gnoskos. I know whom I have believed, trusted for my spiritual well-being, Pistio, and am persuaded that he, not me, he is able to keep, guard, protect what I have committed to him until that day, my life, my soul my everything. Now, verse, what's the next verse? 13? Hold fast. What are you holding fast to? Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Back to Christ Jesus. Notice it. Listen to me. Hold fast. What does he say? Hold fast your Bible. Carry it to church. No, they didn't have them. He said, hold fast the healthy, sound words. Actually, it says, hold fast is the word echo. It's the word for possession. It's your possession. It's your ability. Keep it. Possess with. It's the same word that the demonic lady in the book of Acts, they kept going behind Paul and them. Echo. And see, what you listen to, that's why I'm telling you, be very careful who you just say, I like this guy, I'm going to keep listening to this guy. Listen to the Holy Spirit. You can find people that tickle your ears. You can find people that are good orators. You can find people that even know the Word of God. You're not listening to man. You're listening to God. If you learn anything, you want to be listening to the Spirit so that you're not misled by man. So hold fast is echo, and it's the form pattern here, but it's in the King James, it's the form. It means a sketch for imitation, a pattern, an example. But notice what he says, of sound, healthy, uncorrupt, true doctrine, and their words. Listen to me, not a book, because they were speaking them. As he was speaking them, as he, well, he wrote this letter, but as he was speaking of and teaching them, they were hearing the truth of God's word by the Spirit. And it became doctrine. It became the word of God. But he's reminded them of what he said to them before. And that's what the Holy Spirit says he'll do. I'll give you remembrance of everything that Christ said to you. He's going to be your teacher. He's going to be your guide. And now... Paul is just saying, remember the sound words. Because why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You hear it. Even when you're reading it and it's going through your eye porters, because now we all can afford to have six Bibles in the house, and we need to read them. As you read them, it goes through your eye portals. You hear it with your soul, and the hearing has the content or the intent to obey it. Because I'm there for instruction to learn so I can be washed and cleansed and not continue to walk in a lie. So when he opens my eyes, I hear it with my heart and I ask, Lord, how can I do that? I see what I want to do, but I can't perform it. And then we ask for power to go up and do it. And we get up and we go out by faith to do it. And he gives you the ability as you step on the water. He's not going to get you, I got this figured out. I got to step on water now. No, he lets you walk on water once you go. You got to get out of the boat by faith. Then you can walk on water. But then we look back and we get entangled and we see all the affairs of this life and we start to sink. The good news is, is we know who to cry out to so that we can keep walking on water and do the supernatural that we have no ability to do without the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, he says here, oh, 14, that good thing, 
What are you holding fast to? That good thing. What are you holding fast to? See, because a lot of Christians are holding fast to some really bad stuff. And Paul is telling us in his swan song here, his final words, that we should hold fast to that good thing, the gospel. Hold fast to the gospel, to the good news, which was committed to you. See, he committed his life, and so Christ committed to him. That's a marriage, isn't it? Two people committed? That's a marriage. Since Paul committed his life, Christ already committed his. Listen, if you believe Jesus died and rose again, you can know now he gave everything. He didn't just go, ah, I think I'll take a couple wounds, a couple bullets for you. No, no, no. He died for his bride. I don't know what Adam did. The first Adam, he's like, hey, Eve, don't be talking to that dude. That dude's a, that's a serpent. Don't be talking to the serpent. I don't think we're supposed to do that. Wrong tree, Eve. I don't know what he did to try to persuade her, but God allowed that to happen on purpose, almost. I don't know how to say it in this vernacular. But he allowed it to prove us whether we would freely choose God later. You see what I mean? Free will had to be enacted. It had to come. But if we were just walking in the garden and always created and always there, and there was never any temptation, never anything to choose, then God would still have robots that just had an environment that they had to be with him. So he had to give us free will to choose. So there had to be something, and there was one tree. There was one other voice. Don't get confused like there's a bunch of them. That's why it's so important that we understand that he says, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. There's only one other voice, but it comes in all kinds of affairs, all kinds of entanglements, all kinds of things that will entrap your heart and your ears and your obedience and try to deceive you into following down it instead of holding fast the gospel. Holding fast to God, holding fast to that which you committed to and he's committed to you completely. That's why God hates divorce. It's one man, one woman for life, eternity in the spiritual realm. The physical realm, we die or we become more alive than we've ever been before. It's just, that's just the physical, but it's physical first that really tells us so much about the spiritual because God gives us instruction how to walk out the physical so that clearly tells you what the kingdom of God is about. When you're walking out the instructions of the physical, it tells you what he requires in the spiritual. It actually becomes the spiritual. Are you serious? Even as he speaks the word, it's the spiritual. I mean, it's just, it's so deep. It's that, that it's, you can wade in it. It's so shallow. It's so profound. No, I'm sorry. I was trying to be funny, and it wasn't real funny because it's so profound. So what are you holding fast to? That's what I'm asking you because, see, so many people are holding fast to their career. They're holding fast to their paycheck. They're holding fast to their credit card. They're holding fast to their physical relationships. They're holding fast on things that are going to burn. They're holding fast on things that steal your heart. They're holding fast on things that the enemy says, you can see them and you know you need them. Go get them. And they're not holding fast to the spiritual truths of the gospel where the Holy Spirit is leading us. Notice what he said. Hold fast, 14, that good thing which was committed to you. How do I hold it fast? How do I keep it? Look, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Now he says that we're together. We're a family again. It's us. Not not. I, not I keep it by the Holy Spirit that dwells in me, but he put everybody in the same family, in the same place, in the same fellowship. And he says, keep by, guard by, preserve by the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, if you're in the King James, who dwells, abides, lives in us. It means to watch it, to guard it, to preserve its way. Obey it. Ooh. If you use the lexicon. If you use the lexicon, uh, the first usage of that would be in Hebrew is in 12.7. Are you serious? Exodus 12.7, is that what I put down? Oh, 12.17. Wow, because 12.7 was putting blood on the doorpost. That was pretty cool. 
uh, 1217 is where it's first used at. So you shall observe or obey the Feast of Unleavened Bread. What's that, Greg? Well, it's the week-long feast that precedes the Passover, the blood on the doorpost. And you were supposed to be taking all the leaven and the influence of evil out of your life. That's, that's what he's talking about, guarding. While you're holding fast to the gospel, you're saying, Lord, wash me and cleanse me. Remove the influence of evil and all these other things that are trying to entice me and draw me out. You shall obey the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on the same day I will, this is what God's going to do if you commit to him, have brought you out, your armies, your tribes, out of the land of Egypt. Come bring it to us, bringing us out of the world. Therefore you shall obey this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. See, it hasn't changed. The festival's over with, but now the Holy Spirit's watching and cleansing us and still bringing us out. God saves us, takes us out of the world, and then he takes the world out of us. The same way he saved them out of Egypt, and then he took Egypt out of them. But what happened to the first generation? They get to Kadesh Barnea, the Valley of Decision, and they're like, no, we can't go in. There's giants in the land. And so he couldn't get the, the Egypt out of them. They said, Moses, what are you doing? Bring us out here to die. Take us back to Egypt. At least we had the garlics and the leeks and the onions. And they didn't want to obey what God was saying to do. Go in. I've preserved the land for you. I've given it to you. And it's the same thing as we get to the New Testament. And Paul is telling us to hold fast, to keep, to grab a hold and preserve Find out what it is in the gospel and allow the Holy Spirit to keep it through you. See, he says you can't do it by yourself. 14b, keep, guard, observe by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost who dwells in you. Because if you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, that, that means that you've been sealed like preserving canning jars. But then the Holy Spirit gives you gifts. He can empower you and send you out and use you and anoint you. You're holding fast, and as you obey, he'll give you more. 15. This you know, and this is right. Really, listen to me. This is why I did the whole chapter. It's right here. If you need to know why, we did the whole chapter 1. And we're going to go all the way to about 2, 7, or 8. Listen, here it is. You got to get it. Because there's those that he's telling to follow. There's those that the Holy Spirit is saying... Hey, keep this, guard this, follow this. And there's those that won't. This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me. See, he's under arrest for the gospel and everybody turned away from him. Everybody turned away from him. Among whom are Fugitus. That's an F sound. Fugitus. No, Fugulus. Fugulus is how it's pronounced. And um, Hermogenes. Hermogenes, yeah, Hermogenes. And these are hard words to pronounce, but it's important to know. See, because uh, uh, Fugulus comes from the word fugitive. It's the word fugitive. Right? But I don't want you to miss, have turned away from me. It's the word uh, apostopho. See, because this is what's going on. When you turn away from truth and you're not holding on to the good news, you apostate. You become apostate. They were with Paul. They were following Paul. They were listening to Paul. And they went apostate. It's apostropho. Probably where we get the word apostrophe. I don't know. Looks like it. Uh, but it means to turn away or back. It means to pervert or to turn away from, right? Uh, fugulos is a little fugitive. Now listen to this because this is what they put beside his name, an apostate Christian, right? And Hermogenes is, listen, lucky born, or born of, born of Mercury, what do we put by his name? An apostate Christian. It's, it actually means Hermes born. And Hermes is, is Greek mythology, 
and he was a messenger for the deities in Greek mythology, Hermes. Uh, remember, they thought Paul was Hermes before they beat him to death. Um, but listen, lucky born, this is what it means. Financially and educationally well. Listen to me. Be careful, guys. I'm not... You can't serve two masters. Either you're getting your wisdom from God and, and, and you're not serving money, but you're serving God. Or you might be lucky born and you're listening to the wrong gospel and be a fugitive from grace and apostating because you're pursuing the wrong thing, looking for earthly, central, demonic wisdom and chasing after money. And it gets you entangled in the affairs of this life as you begin to pursue that. Be careful because they're trying to get you caught up in a political future of our nation and a lot of physical battles and we need to stay focused on holding on to the gospel, guarding the gospel, and then speaking to people. Just like he said, hold fast the pattern of sound words, the sound word of God's word. That's what we share with people. That's what you share with people. You can come up with a whole bunch of good, really wise arguments as to why people should get saved. I mean, I would, listen, I was actually sharing truth with these two people earlier, and, and they're so mocking that she takes a video and goes, here's somebody that can actually argue the gospel and puts a video on the counter on her phone. I wasn't trying to argue with them. I was just trying to tell them truth. But somebody that was trying to explain away something would get you caught up in their wisdom instead of just hearing truth and the Holy Spirit striking their conscience and the sound words convicting them. See, there's a difference. There's a difference between trying to wrangle and quarrel with somebody and then just sharing the truth and letting the Holy Spirit. So that's why I said, okay, have a nice day and walked away. I'm not going to argue with them. It was obvious the Holy Spirit wasn't working. They were gnashing their teeth. They were not accepting anything that God would say, and they wanted to stay in their sin. So, listen, these guys apostated. But then he goes straight from them. He mentions them. He's in a prison cell. He knows where everybody's at. He's letting the news go to Timothy so that these two, uh, Fugulus and Hermogenes, doesn't come around. And they go, yeah, we heard you were with Paul. Go on and teach us. See, Paul's already called them out. Paul mentioned names all the time. People today will go, that's not love. You're mentioning names. You should not talk about Joel Osteen. You should not talk about Kenneth Copeland. You should not talk about Creflo Dollar. You should not call out Joyce Myers. What? I'm following the pattern of sound words of the gospel. And if you don't call out their names and all you do is mention word of faith... <coughs> How is somebody supposed to know that that's word of faith? And they'll be down the road a long ways before they realize, hey, wait a minute, this ain't Jesus. Just call out their names. That's what God said to do. That's what Paul did. And he wrote three quarters, three quarters of the New Testament. I don't have any problem with it. I'm not trying to do it to be mean. I pray that they will repent. I pray that they will wake up. I pray that they'll be converted with sound doctrine. But you know what? If somebody don't call you out, how are you ever going to know you're wrong? If you're living in your own little kingdom on your own little throne and everything you say is gold because you have thousands of followers and nobody will say, hey, that ain't what the Bible says. You're building your own little kingdom instead of God's. That you've been freely given. So then he moves on to uh, verse 16. That's a hard one. On a Q for us. On a C for us. On a C for us. That's how that's pronounced. The Lord grant mercy to the household of On a C for us, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. Isn't that a true friend? Paul's in prison, but I'm coming to find him. Paul started a prison ministry backward. Or is it the right way to minister wherever you're at? Writing letters all across the world. So he sought him out and found him. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well 
how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. Ephesus means permitted. You know what Ano Sephorus means? Bringing profit. Listen, listen. When you search out and find the truth and someone preaching the truth, it's going to bring profit to your life. You're going to be profitable. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night so that you may learn to observe all that is written in it. Then you shall be prosperous, and then you shall be of good success. Search for good, sound, healthy doctrine. Hold on to it. Hold fast to it. Don't stop just because other people stop. Don't turn away because somebody else did. Don't partner up with people, which is probably what uh, Fubulus and Hermogenes did. They partnered up and they went out and started their own little work and their own little thing and was talking about Paul. Ephesus means permitted. That was modern day Turkey. 99% Muslim today. It's where John ended up at when he came back from the Isle of Patmos and was patched as Pastor Demetrius there. Chapter 2. You, therefore, because of all of this that he said here, this is what we have to understand. He's given from jail, he's given a report of everything that's going on. He's warning against apostasy. He's saying that it happens even right when you're right there in the midst of sound doctrine. If you don't hold to it, if you don't grasp a hold of it. And then he's saying that there's others that are prof profitable um, when they seek it out. And he says, you therefore, it's all written because of that, he calls him his son, be strong in the grace that is in, where is it at? Christ Jesus. Now, I can tell you some of the versions say Jesus Christ. It should be Christ Jesus. You've got to find my words. Where's my words? Strong is, is actually, it, it's the same word that's used in Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. It means to be made strong, to increase in strength, and it means to be bold. It means to be bold. The first use is in Acts 9.22. Um, we're not going to go there. You can look there later if you'd like. But tell him, look where he says. He says he doesn't say be strong in your bank account, be strong and go to the gym and work out. I'm not saying don't do temple maintenance. Uh, bodily exercise profits little, though. That's what the Bible says. Just profits little. But he says be strong in the grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. Be strong in the grace, the unmerited favor. Be strong in what God is doing, what God is leading you to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in Christ Jesus, all the grace of God. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. And the things that you have heard, once again, sound words, that heard them. Not the things you read, because it isn't written down yet. You and I can turn it to that because it's now written down, and we're hearing it down the corridors of time. But remember that people hear. Faith comes by hearing. We're supposed to be speaking the Word of God, studying the Word of God, spending time with the living Word of God, and allowing the Holy Spirit to equip us and send us out to be a witness and speak the manifold grace of God that we're holding fast to. And the things that you heard from me among many martyrs witnesses it's the greek word martyrs it's one that and and, and um uh, means that died for their faith a martyr one who died for their faith commit did i ever do commit uh it actually is <laughs> it, it means to place alongside to deposit a trust for protection and it's interesting because the Holy Spirit commits to us. God, When we commit, God commits to us. And then he places his Holy Spirit in us as a trust, as a down payment. And then what we're supposed to go do is, is give people the truth, the gospel, and commit it alongside of them and see if they'll believe it. And then the Holy Spirit will seal them. But all we're called to do is be like a small type of that to commit it to other people. 
find people that were talent scouts and we commit it to who? To faithful, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The ability comes from God. I'll do it. I'm telling you, I'm going to do a sermon one day about Abel because it's all from God. But you have to choose to do that. Now listen, where does faithfulness come from? Listen, you're not faithful. I'm not faithful. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Love. It looks like joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. It can only be through the Holy Spirit as you hold fast the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit that He teaches you to be faithful. He brings that fruit in your life. We can't be faithful. We're unfaithful. But God is faithful and He can't deny Himself. He's faithful when we're faithless. He can't deny himself. So we do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit teaches us how to be faithful servants of the living God. And so we're supposed to commit these words. We're supposed to be a witness to people and give them the words. And then they become faithful because of the Holy Spirit. And they go out and do the same thing. It's called discipleship. We're committing. We're laying along as a trust. We're saying here. And that's what we're doing right now, by the way. Um, and anybody that makes up other plans, it really isn't the way it's supposed to be done. We're supposed to spend time in the Word of God, go through the Word of God, commit it to other people. They hear it. They go, wow. I remember the first time I went to Bible study, and my Bible study leader could not pronounce the words. Not these names. He couldn't pronounce big words. He learned to read when he got saved at about the age of 48. He was dyslexic all of his life. He learned to read by sight words in the Bible and was teaching the Bible, and was right in his context, but couldn't even say the words, because they were too big for him. And I remember distinctly, first Bible study, scared to death, but I was like, wow, God can use him, he can use me. That's the way it's supposed to be, that we see the power of God in a life, not the power of man in a life. And we're getting to it here in a minute, because we don't want to be entangled. We needed to go through all this to get there. Because it's so easy to follow something else of no profit. To follow something else that leads us astray from hanging on to sound doctrine. After all, we've got all these new gadgets. We've got all these new phones. We've got all these new things. And these people didn't know the stuff that we know then, really. Isn't it the Holy Spirit? Isn't it God that we're supposed to know? So they knew the same God we know now. They had the same spirit that we have now. Even Elijah had the same spirit that we have now. And he prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years, then didn't. Same spirit, same God. It's not got anything to do with books and libraries and all of the ministries and stained glass windows and buildings. It's not got anything to do with our education, which leads us away from God. It's got to getting rid of those affairs getting rid of that entanglement, getting alone and being still to hear the voice of God, as Elijah did. He wasn't in the whirlwind. He was in the still, small voice. You can trust him. He loves you. Verse 3, we get into our context. You, therefore, now he's got some more therefores. It's always, what is it there for? Must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. See it? There's where I wanted you to see Jesus is first because look at the hardship he endured. Listen, he endured the, the cross, despising the shame, but is now set down at the right hand of God, and we call him Christ Jesus. But he's pointing back to what he endured through Gethsemane and through the cross and through the beating and through the, 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 the shame and the spitting and the mocking and the nailing to a tree. He's pointing back to the flesh as a good soldier. Who is the greatest example of a good soldier in the army of the living God but the one who has come as the commander? Remember that? Joseph was, or Joshua was trying to be a tough guy and lead the army, Moses' his people across. And he's like, whose side are you on? And he says, no. But as the army, or as the commander of the armies of the living God, I have come. Wait a minute, I ask you, whose side you was on? No. Because <laughs> it was Jesus. He's the commander of the armies of the living God. And he's not on either side. We need to be on his side because we come from his side where he was pierced. 
and we need to be his bride and follow him. He's the commander. He's the one enlisted us. He's the one that has called us. He's the one that sent back the Holy Spirit. He's the one that's doing the work. Oh my goodness, I'm going to pop. <laughs> Fruit pops, doesn't it? When it too much juice in it, too much Holy Spirit. Oh, I'm just teasing. It doesn't, not unless there's a lot of heat. Really when it rots it. Oh, just, I'm rotting away in my flesh. My flesh is rotting away then. I knew you'd say something crazy. <laughs> Look, you therefore must endure. It actually says you therefore in the King James endure hardness, not endure hardships. Endure hardness as a good soldier. It means to undergo hardships, to be afflicted, to endure afflictions, to suffer trouble. And this is the first usage of it. Listen, to much suffering shall we enter the kingdom of God. If we're standing for God and being a soldier for God and we're actually being a witness for God, people aren't going to like it. There's going to be suffering. And we're supposed to have fellowship with his sufferings in order to become like him. When Paul and the boys, and they were doing it, and they were walking it out, and they were being led by the Spirit, they killed them all. Because they were Christ-like. They were being Christ-like. But we run from them. We give people medication for them. We don't want you to suffer at all. Nothing bad should ever happen in your life. Not if you're faith. Not if you're a faith. Health, wealth, and prosperity. You should not be going through anything. Listen, we're behind enemy lines. And no one engaged in warfare. No one that warreth entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he might please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Listen, unless you're a POW or an apostate, we shouldn't be caught up. We need to grab a hold of get a hold of and hold fast the good news that was given to us the calling that is upon us for the ministry of reconciliation of souls and get rid of all the other entanglements that doesn't mean you don't go to work it doesn't mean you don't go to the marketplace but our focus is spiritual not physical our life is no longer to re recount anything of flesh and blood it's spiritual. We have to see the spiritual enemy. The spiritual enemy is the one that says, oh, it's all evolution. And that will never confess that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. Will never confess that God spoke and created the heavens and the earth. He wants to cover it up with a lie and let people think they're okay to follow monkeys. That's nonsense. Why would you want to follow a monkey? Well, then now we know why we act like animals in the street. If you teach them there's nobody that's coming, that there's no punishment going to happen. If you raise your children like there's nobody coming home, you're always going to get somebody that is spoiled, that is cheated, that is lawless. That was a little tidbit for next week's verse, too, by the way. Colossians 2.8. We're going to go there. We've done it before. We're going to do it again. It falls in this line after I prayed about it. Listen, are you warring? Are you engaged in warfare? Have you been called to be a soldier? Do you, do you, are you the bride of Christ? Do you have the Spirit of God in you? Listen to me. This is not like, well, you know, Greg, you're a Jesus freak, and I just am saved, and all I'm going to do is just live for Jesus and do my job. No, no, no. We're all in the same family. We're all doing the same thing. We're all part of the same body. We're the same bride. We have the same spirit, the same calling, the same ministry. There's not a one for you and one for me and one for them. It, it, it's all of us at one with Christ, the same body. It's supposed to be of the same mind doing the same thing. And when that happens, people will see our love for one another and they'll want to be part of it. But as long as we're dissected and chasing our own stuff and ignoring and just doing what we want to do when we feel like doing it. Well, I really don't want to, you know, I volunteered, but I volunteered to come here and I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, okay. 
Have a nice day. No one engaged. Now let's let's just kind of break this down a moment. Since we're on our verse finally. Oh. <laughs> I didn't do good soldier of uh, verse 3. We're almost done, by the way. Verse 3, good soldier is valuable, virtuous, honest, worthy. But it means a camper out. And and it's because this is not our home. You're, we're just camping in a tent here. And we're a camper out. We're a common warrior is what it says, or a common soldier. But I, I, I left because there's a guy named Vince that works at the county jail. And he always says, hey, camper, what are you doing? Because he calls these guys that come into the jail campers because it's not their home. <coughs> he just calls them, uh, you know, campers. It's weird. But anyway, when I seen that camper outer, I go, oh, my goodness. Wait till I tell him what that word means. Um, so now, if you're a POW, what do we do by faith? We put our shields of faith together and we pray for people and we go to the enemy's camp and we take back the people that are apostate, that are POW, that are living their own way. That's what the Word of God is for. We can't go back and take them and go, come here, I told you that's not what the Word of God said. You have to just share truth the same way. And you treat them like they are unbelievers and you keep sharing truth. And if the Holy Spirit sets them on fire with a desire to search out the Word and to be a soldier, then it's up to the Holy Spirit. But there's so many people that are POWs. They're prisoners of war in the enemy's camp, and they're following a false gospel like the northern tribes were. And, and, you know, if you're not careful, you'll do what the southern tribe did and go the wrong way instead of letting God do the work. You'll try to marry in, and you'll say, love, 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 and we're tolerating, and yes, you're right, you're fine, that's good stuff, and you'll start to compromise <laughs> real sound doctrine in order to reach them with love. And you don't want to do that. That's what they're crying out for us to do today. Now, there is complete apostates that don't have nothing to do with faith, and they don't even know who Jesus is. But there's people that know Jesus, and they're moving toward apostasy. And you cannot go to them and tolerate their actions. That's why James says, on some, save with fear, and other, or excuse me, same, some have compassion, others with fear, hating, hating even the garment, defiled by the flesh. Because they go back to their own ways, their own earthly, sensual, demonic wisdom, and they're defiling their own garment. They're destroying their own soul. And we want them to come back into the fold and hear his voice and follow. And so we're just soldiers in the army of the living God. And uh, if you're not actively listening, putting on the armor of God, going out to battle, and, and, and understanding that the armor of God, when you read it, Paul's just, every bit of it's Christ. He's right there with a soldier. He's on house arrest. For a while, he was chained to a soldier. Then they moved him to a house, and they let people take care of all of his deeds, and he was just there. They trusted him. He wasn't going anywhere. Isn't that crazy? We're in the middle of Bible study, so give us a few minutes and we'll be done. So no one that warreth, no one engaged. And it means this, it's strato o, strato o, where you get the word strategy. No one engaged. And it means to serve in a military campaign uh, or to execute the apostolate, which is to be, an apost uh, uh, to, to be one sent forth as an apostle. And it also means to contend with carnal inclinations. Okay, this word is used three different ways. And, and so you're warring against your own flesh, saying no, 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 because your biggest enemy is your own flesh. Mike Avenue used to always say, He'd look in the mirror and say, I found the enemy. And he'd say, no, no, no. Because the enemy is lying to us and we follow the lie. Our own flesh is the biggest enemy because we've already been set free from the penalty. We've been set free from the power. We, we can run the race. We can walk in newness of life. But, the, but, but our carnal inclinations, what we used to do, our old habits 
the enemy can easily toss that out as temptation and you just go right back into it. This is my safe place. I like doing this. This is where I go. This is where I run when things are not going right and I reward myself and I do these things and it's carnal inclinations, which are sin, right? And so we're in this military campaign and we have to understand what soldiers do, right? And we're supposed to go out. And if you, if you are a Christian, then you are supposed to be one sent forth. Go, Jesus said. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So we know we've been given a commission to go. And now we have to decide, are we going to do it God's ways and hold on to that good word, that good sound doctrine? Or are we going to get entangled? That's the next word. No one who war to no one engaged in warfare entangles himself. It means to involve with, to entwine. This is the first usage. To interweave with the affairs of this life. And you can read for homework. It's over in uh, uh, 2 Peter 2, 20, 21 and 22. He talks about this. Same, he uses this same word. It's the only other place it's used for entanglements. And listen, affairs means transactions. It means negotiations. It means business. It means occupation. Are you listening to me? This is the only time it's ever used, but the word means to busy self one with trade or to occupy here. This is not where we're, our home is. We're aliens. We're mere pastor buyers, by the way. When they talk about aliens, it's you. It's anybody that's engaged in warfare and is not entangled. They're calling you the alien. They're the ones they're coming after. I don't care what they say. We got to stay true to the word of God. And when the word of God tells us, we should speak it and not let it hide in darkness, no matter what they're going to do. Well, what, what are you talking about? The affairs of this life. Now, see, this isn't Zoe. This is bios. This is another word for life that you're not going to see very often, but it's bios. It means this present state of existence. You and I presently have a body. We're presently flesh, but we know we're not to regard anything as flesh. See, that's where we get the word biology from, bios. It's your biology. This is our present existence in this tent, but we're not supposed to get ourselves in, caught up in the affairs, the transactions, the negotiations, the business, the politics of this bios. And by implication, it means the means of livelihood. In fact, it's over in, uh, let's look in Matthew 12, 44. Let's look at the first usage in Matthew 12, 44. I'm almost done, guys and gals. But I have to get through the entire context of what I think God give us. 12, 44, first usage. What did I say, Matthew 12, 44? I wanted to go back to the Old Testament, but I did we're just going to look at what Matthew says in 12:44. That's not it. It's a good it's a good scripture, but I don't think that's it. I did this earlier. Oh, it's Mark 12:44. I did this earlier. I was looking at it and I go, "We're going to go to that." And it's actually about sweeping your house clean. That's what Peter's talking about over in uh, uh, Second Peter uh, that I just told you about being entangled. He actually says it, that, it, that same verse there from Matthew 12, uh, 44, about sweeping your house clean and you don't fill it up with the things of God. Then the demons come back twice as, or uh, seven times as worse. Mark 12, I did this earlier. It all lines up together if you really wanted to do another hour of Bible study, but I know you guys don't. I could go to 2 Peter and go to Matthew 12 and then come here. But I skipped that and told you to do it as homework and search it out. So 1244 is this about the widow's might. Let's start in 41. And now Jesus said opposite the treasury, hey, the entanglement's all about money. Listen to me. 
when you start searching the words out, you find that a lot of it's about mammon. It's about money. It's got connotations of that. What are they doing right now? They're trying to erase the inflation. They're trying to bring in all of this transactions. They're going to go to digital. And they're going to do uh, 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 social credit scores where you're going to be shut down and not be able to buy, sell, and trade if you do not agree with all their rhetoric and their lies and their deception that goes against God. It's called death culture. And eventually it'll be a mark so that they won't have to even trace you on AI with their false Holy Spirit that knows everything about you. It's their unholy spirit. It's part of the unholy trinity. They have an unholy spirit called AI. Artificial intelligence. It's tracking you. And you know what? We're so crazy and caught up that we go out and pay them money to give us the tracking device. And then we pay them money to teach us on the tracking device. And we don't even get it. I was wanting to throw mine so bad today. Like you want me to pay you $200 a month and you can't even get my credit card right on your account after I've been to your store this many times and called you this many times you already know what my credit card is your AI knows everything that's possible to know about me on the planet and has stored up the information knows where I've been on the computer knows everything well this is the computer I call it a phone or a camera a walkie talkie Listen, so he said opposite to treasury, money, saw how the people put money into the treasury, and many who were rich and had education, it's not there, reading into, put in much, thought they were great because of it. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, a couple pennies, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, notice this, notice, notice, they're watching this. They're seeing this going on. And Jesus doesn't just stand there and talk. He said, come here, guys, huddle, holy huddle. Did you see what she just did? He doesn't want the masses to see it. He doesn't want them to hear it. He called his disciples, those who are drawing near, those who his sheep that hear his voice, and he knows them and they follow him. And he said, assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. What? Are you kidding me? I give $25,000 last year to that church. You're telling me that the poor people gave more? I should have a plaque on the wall. That room should be named after me. I paid for that kitchen. I'm sorry, I'm just being weird and facetious and fleshly, demonic in words, not character. Why would you say that, Lord? Verse 44. For they all put in out of their abundance what's left over. You know how the, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks? Well, I'm finished with my 7,000 words today. Now I'm going to talk about God. I just use that verse different than you've ever heard before. But listen, out of the abundance, the overflow, I had some surplus. I did everything I wanted to do in my life for my livelihood. I did everything. I've got all of my cars. I've got all of my houses. I've got all of my stuff. But now I'm going to put some money in and be religious and people will notice. And actually, they're in this place where there's these, these big horns that when the money rolled down, it was all coins. They didn't have paper money then. All coins. They were big tubes. And it would go, hoo, 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 and it'd make big noise. And that's why he talks about, don't toot your own horn when you give. And it would go, hoo, 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 and you could hear how much money was going down. And people would hear it in this treasury area. And this woman went, and that's how come it was noticeable. Notice what he says, though. They put it out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had. Her whole livelihood. We're here because the first usage is that word livelihood. That's, where, that's what we were talking about, which is what her life, bios, livelihood. 
You can't give some of your life and go, I'm going to heaven. Jesus didn't give some of it and say, if you believe in some of my life, you get salvation. And unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, you have to give all of your life. And I know people say that salvation is free, and it is, but it costs us, it costs God his son's life. And it costs our life. If we want to follow and be true followers, we have to die and not be entangled with the affairs, the transaction, this fleshly stuff. We have to see over it into the spiritual realm and say, this is about the spirit. And even though they're being mean to me, they're talking and reviling me, even though they don't like me, even though this is hard, I'm still here for the souls until God takes me home. We're all being poured out as drink offerings if we're living the gospel. Because we put up with the trash. We put up with the death. We put up with the gnashing of the teeth, the mocking. We put up with those things and we look over and we love them because Christ first loved us. And we still tell them the truth whether they want to hear it or not. Listen, that's what the gospel is. Wish we could live it. It's easy to talk about. I mean, I'm just telling you what the words say. Very hard to drive by a DQ and not get a milkshake. <laughs> and get entangled. Very hard to get your paycheck and go, wait a minute, there's a couple hours missing. What are you guys doing in there? And get caught up like they're paying you, really, when it's really God that pays you. It's really God that provides for all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's not your company. Your company would be on fire and burnt and dead and not even living if it wasn't for God. He knows where we're at. He knows every hair we don't have on our head. <laughs> he can count really good. Zero's a number. You guys seen that? Who invented zero? Thanks for nothing. <laughs> Dorks. Listen, so are you worried? Are you fighting? Are you living the gospel and fighting with carnal inclinations? Oh, it's already won, but we have to stand in it. Hand out the spoils. Tell people the truth. Say no so that they'll know to say no. That's what a witness does. That's what an example does. They lay down their life because Christ laid down his life. That's what Paul's saying to us here. Not to get caught up and entangled and think that my next vacation, my next house, my next pay raise, my next position, my next career. We are called with a calling, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's the voice we want to hear. Are you entangled with some affairs? Why would we not that we might please him, be agreeable with, to seek to be agreeable with him who called us or enlisted us, have chosen us to be soldiers, stratologia, I like that, it sounds like a song, stratologia, stratologia, that's the word. It's word for strategy. Yeah, that, that one is for soldier, it's word for strategy though, there is a strategy, see, God has a plan. God has a word. God has a way. God has already worked the plan. It's finished. Now the enemy has a strategy, and he's perverting God's plan and wants us, and he steals our inheritance by getting us to follow his strategy. It's called Methodia in Ephesians 6. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might that you may be able to stand against the methods of the devil, the Methodia. He perverts what God does. He takes it, he sees it, and then he uses it with his own uh, 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 evil purposes. And you see it everywhere. Even now, think about this. Even now, everything that they, that they want to try to preach to us in the physical, in their new religion, is actually mostly true in the spiritual realm. There is no male or female in the spiritual realm. But they want it to be in the physical. 
Listen, almost everything they're preaching in us is not true in the spiritual realm. Or excuse me, is true in the spiritual realm, but they're trying to make it in the physical and be the God of it in the physical. And it's not true. But Christians are falling for it and following their plan in the physical instead of living in the spiritual. And we're spiritual children of God by faith. Oh, my goodness. Move on. Get some glasses on. You can't see. I got my license renewed only because of an angel yesterday. Her name was Angel. <laughs> she's been working there for years, and I know her. Yeah, she's like, well, close your left eye then and tell me that again. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a C. That's not a Q or an O. I got it the third time. It was funny. Are you entangled? Listen, next week's verse, Colossians 2.8. Backward if you're on Timothy. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians 2 8. We've had this verse, and you should remember this verse, but it's beware. Another warning. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of this world, and not according to Christ. Listen, Christ Jesus is not there. Christ, the anointed of God. That's what we want to do. Colossians 2.8, write it down, memorize it, study it, be ready to quote it. I want you to come out of your mouth so you can learn that you can do it in the marketplace. You can share it with other people. Look up the word cheat. It's, it's the word spoil. Because if we don't do it according to training, we're spoiled and we think that we are entitled and we can just get this salvation for no reason. It has to be according to God's plan of engagement and war. Father, thank you for your spirit. Thank you for calling us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Lord, we pray that you give us wisdom and how to be your people and how to live. Pour out your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you.